Welcome, everyone. My name is Adrian Monk, Managing Director of Public Engagement here at the World Economic Forum. Welcome to this opening press conference for the 2019 annual meeting. I am delighted to be joined by our seven co-chairs of the meeting. We have from the business community Satya Nadella, Chief Executive Officer of Microsoft. We have from our global shapers community of young people in their 20s doing extraordinary things around the world. A great group, uh, Basima Abdul Rahman, founder of Green Building Consulting in Iraq from Erbil. Juan David Aristazabal, co-founder of Todos por la Educación in Colombia. Nura Baruba, a member of the governing body of the European Youth Parliament from Sweden. Julia Luscombe, who directs strategic initiatives at Feeding America from Chicago. Akira Sakano, co-founder of RDND in Osaka. And Mohammed Hassan Mohammed. He's the chairman of the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. I'm delighted to welcome all of them to this annual meeting and to share with you their hopes and expectations of what we can do this week here in Davos. And first of all, I'm going to turn to Satya to share his expectations of this meeting. Satya. Thank you so much, um, Adrian. It's uh, such an honor uh, to be here with this uh, group. Uh, like my daughter said, what did I do to deserve to be uh, with this group of people and your accomplishments and particularly your vision for our world is just so impressive. We're at a critical time um, in history where the impact uh, of technology, the fourth industrial revolution, is going to be felt in every part of our daily life, in every part of our economies and societies. And so computing, in some sense, is becoming much more part of the very fabric of our lives. It's getting embedded in the world. It's not any more separate. In other words, digital technology is not even separate uh, from our uh, core fabric of how we live uh, and how we operate. The world, in some sense, is becoming a computer. Uh, this change is inevitable, uh, but all of us have important choices to make to ensure that technology creates more opportunity and equitable growth. How can we ensure that technology drives economic growth, but it's equitable? That it creates broad surplus across our societies. That the latest innovations are applied to address our most pressing challenges, to expand access for education and healthcare everywhere. It empowers people with disabilities. Every country, every company has a part to play. It requires what I call tech intensity, the potential for companies and countries to jumpstart their growth by not only adopting the latest technology, but also building their own digital capability. To foster tech intensities, countries need to prioritize three things, all of which require deep collaboration and partnership. First, we need to encourage tech adoption. Uh, countries need to prioritize expanding access to faster and cheaper internet connectivity. After all, without connectivity, adoption of the latest state-of-the-art technology becomes impossible. Second, to hone their tech capabilities, countries will need a workforce that's trained to use technology productively. We know that the jobs of today are not going to be the jobs of tomorrow. Countries must ensure that their populations and future generations are equipped with the skills for the future. And third, governments must work in concert with technology industry to guard against the unintended consequences of technology. That means supporting a regulatory environment that promotes innovation and confidence in the use of technology and trust. The concept also applies to organizations. To build tech intensity, every company needs to be able to access the latest platforms and tools rather than spending their valuable resources in creating what already exists. They also need to invest in human capital, fostering a workforce culture that encourages capability building and collaboration. And every industry embraces tech, intens tech intensity. This provides opportunity for economic growth. And that broad surplus is what creates the opportunity for both private and public sector to take action to address the mo some of our society's hardest challenges, bringing hope to the most people who need it that's really ultimately what will be the test of all economic progress. Because economic progress without really creating more equitable opportunity is really not going to 
be of any good. So that's what I hope that this uh, meeting really discusses. And in fact, all of my c fellow co-chairs and their vision for the future is something that I'm looking forward to learning from and taking back with me as well. Thank you. Sacha, thank you very much. Basama, you're here in Davos from Erbil in Iraq. Can you tell us what you're hoping to achieve and see this week? First of all, I want to say, since I'm the first Global Shaper to speak, that I am really honored to be one of the six young people to co-chair the event. It's a huge recognition from the forum and the Global Shapers community to give us the majority of the seat, given that we are representing half, the, half of the population of the world. And it's also a statement to say that it's our right to voice our concerns and solutions for the future that we are willing to live in. So as um, Adrian mentioned, I have founded the first green building company in Iraq with my background in civil engineering that helped me to establish this initiative. The idea of starting the initiative dawned on me first back in August 2014 when the terrorist group called ISIS, also named as Daesh, occupied some of the main big cities in Iraq. I still had another semester to finish my graduate, uh, my graduate degree in the United States. On that night, I couldn't sleep. I feared for my country, my family. I also felt ashamed and sad by the news. Then suddenly, without warning, clarity comes over me in a way that I haven't experienced before. I am overwhelmed by the lucidity I feel. I decided that I take the road less traveled by and go back to Iraq in this critical time to do something positive and impactful. So coming from a country that been going through decades of war, sectarian conflict, dictatorship, we are finally on the brink of a new era. We are about to, to start the rebuilding of the country and reviving the economy. $100 billion is the estimated budget to rebuild Iraq. My mission is to make sure that we invest and build sustainably and green. Basma, thank you so much. One David, your work is with young people and education in Colombia. Can you tell us a little about your hopes for this meeting? Thank you and hola. My name is Juan David and I want to say that when I was thinking tomorrow about this meeting, I thought about my mom. She's an artist. My father is an engineer. And you can imagine, like, that was so crazy when we were kids with Anna, my sister. But all the things that they did when I was young was to, f to put me and to equip me with the skills that I, was, um, that I needed to be here today. They believed in education, and that's why I work in education. Uh, I, grew up in the I, I was born in the coffee region in Colombia. Uh, my grandparents, they started a coffee business like a century ago. They were very, very prosperous. They, they built uh, their business with, the pa with their passion. And as you know, the story doesn't end well. When I was 15, uh, the prices of coffee were so low, and we started to see in our city, in our town, what happened when a city would, or a town depends on commodities. A lot of young people, they lost their jobs. A lot of coffee farmers, they had to stop their business. So it was like a very difficult time for us. A lot of my friends, they went to, unfortunately, to be involved in uh, violence, drugs. I lost a, a teacher, a math teacher. He was killed at that time. And some year later, we had an earthquake in our hometown. Thousands of people died at that time in Armenia. So it was like a very difficult time and one day after the earthquake, I remember that my sister, Anna, said to my parents, like, hey, take me please to the Red Cross. 
And I remember that, like, why she wants to go to the Red Cross? I mean, we are in the middle of a uh, crisis. And she said to my parents, because she was, like, very good on data and with Excel. It's Excel, it's Microsoft, yes, okay. So, and they took her, and she was helping the people, and the, she was helping the Red Cross in the middle of a crisis. And she's my role model. So at that time, I understood that I want to dedicate my lifetime and my energy to equip young people with the skills that they need to be successful in this time and in this era. I knew that, of course, it was not the external forces, just the prices uh, who were, they were not like uh, the responsible of what is happening in El Eje Cafetero in Colombia. It was our fault. We, as Colombians, we were not ready, and we were not equipped, and we were not organizing ourselves. We were not be trained for the future. And as you may know, for the, 60, for the last 50, 60 years, we had a war, a civil war in Colombia. A lot of young people have died in, in this war. So in the last 10 years, with great and nice people from the business sector, from the social works. We have been working to improve education. So we are equipping young people with the skills that they need, like how to work with people, how to communicate, how to engage to each other. Because I think we are in a learning crisis. Young people are not learning what they need to learn. Adults are not learning what they need to learn. Today, 70 million young people are unemployed every, in, in the whole world. Three millions just in Colombia. People have dreams, but now they are not equipped with the right skills to fulfill those dreams. And we need to work on that. So one of the things that I want to do here is to show like we have to not just change the education system, we need to do a revolution in education. That's a great, a great message. Nura, you're here from the European Youth Parliament in Stockholm, engaging young people in politics, getting them excited, getting them involved. Can you tell us a little about, bit more about what you'd like to see at this meeting? Absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. My name is Nura Beruba. I'm a global shaper from the Stockholm Hub. And I believe in the power of people, and I believe in a society where everyone is informed and empowered to shape their own life and that of their community. Therefore, I'm proud to help run the European Youth Parliament, which is a pan-European volunteer-led youth organization working in 40 countries to get young people equipped with the tools and information um, and knowledge um, to be able to, to shape their own lives. With active citizenship education, we change the world by changing people. We need, especially today, an informed and empowered young generation that can hold governments and business accountable, take on projects of their own, and shape their communities. Governance and politics feels like something far away for everyday citizens. We in the European Youth Parliament work to address just that, how to bring politics closer to people and closer to young people. In terms of Davos this week, the issues we have to address are clear. It is the how that is difficult, because what we are seeing now is the deterioration of the, and dissolution of the very institutions and ideals that are required to tackle these issues. We can't fix the problem if we can't fix the process and systems. Corruption, increasing populism and nationalism, countries moving away from multilateralism in a time of increasing global challenges. Both the uh, quality and quantity of democracies in the world are declining. We're seeing increasing inequalities, crackdown on journalism and human rights activists, shrinking space for civil society, and short-termism in a long-term world. We can't fix these problems if we can't fix these processes and systems. I want to address what I believe to be the most important generational crisis. 
on climate change. We are failing on climate change, and failing on climate change is irreversible. There can be no business, peace, life, uh, or happiness on a failing and unlivable planet. Our number one priority this week must be to accelerate climate action and to reshape current policies and business models to stay within planetary boundaries. How is it that we've created a system where it's so easy to make the wrong decisions and so difficult to make the right ones? How is it that the things that are ethically wrong are legally right? What does it tell us about the global commitment when we have all the solutions, yet so little is happening? Our current rules aren't enough to keep fossil fuels in the ground and transition into a zero carbon economy. If we honestly want to solve the climate crisis, we can't just repair a broken system. We, we must reimagine it. You might not have to face um, the consequences of this inaction, but I will, and billions of young people all across the world will. I and we won't be silent ba bystanders in seeing the, the, the deterioration of our common home. Step up on climate action or step aside. My last point is about our ambition this week. It's time to be bold and uncomfortable and to deliver for people and planet. The people outside of Davos are expecting results. The real success of Davos is not measured by the amount of discussions held, but by the positive real impact felt by people on the ground. People in Davos have power, whether it's political, financial, influence, or other. So when we talk about the issues here this week, we can't just talk about things that could be done, because the people that should do those things are us. Let's leave the ego behind. Let's leave short-termism short behind. Let's be bold, attentive, ambitious, and let's d deliver for the entire planet. Nura, thank you very much. I'm just looking all the time at the clock and thinking I'd love to hit, get some questions in from folks outside. And uh, with that in mind, I know how concise and eloquent our co-chairs are. Julia, I'm going to turn to you. You're here from Chicago, from Feeding America. Can you tell us a bit more about what you'd like to see this meeting achieve? Sure. Good morning. I first want to say how honored I am to serve aside um, these inspiring co-chairs. We share a common purpose, which is to live fulfilling lives, to help others to live fulfilling lives, and to steward the planet. It's been relatively easy for me to live a fulfilling life. I grew up in a successful, loving family that set me on a path for an excellent education um, and all the opportunities that come with that. Um, but growing up in Chicago, I saw that others were being left behind. There was the second grader I met at a volunteer event who told me that the lunch um, served that day would likely be the only meal she would have. There was the perplexing situation on the street I grew up on. My side of the street was all white people. The other side of the street, an affordable housing complex, was all black people. These were just a few of the early exposures I had to the deep-seated systemic inequities I continue to see in my community, my country, and the world. I can't help but constantly ask myself, what, do I want, what would I want the world to look like had my circumstances been different? What systems and processes would I want to be in place if I were a refugee and didn't have a passport? What supports would I want to be available if I or someone I was close to fell on hard times? I'm committed to using my privilege to empower others to live fulfilling lives. And I feel so fortunate that I'm able to do that today at Feeding America. We serve the 40 million people in the United States who are facing hunger. Even in the richest country in the world, one in eight people and one in six children do not have the food they need to thrive. And this is despite plenty of food being available. Last year, Feeding America uh, prevented 3.5 billion pounds of food from going to waste and provided it to people in need. The United States is a country that's benefited tremendously from globalization, yet there are persistent inequities and inefficiencies. Shaping a global architecture for more equitable and sustainable growth must be our priority. 
It is the priority of the young people that we are here representing today. Across the world, we need to make sure that all food produced is put to good use. We need to tackle the root causes of food insecurity. We need to develop solutions that are targeted to meet the needs of the most disadvantaged communities and populations. This will take coordinated efforts of the social, public, and private sector and firm commitments. It will take inclusion of people facing hunger in developing solutions. It will take bringing the best of data and technology to match the supply and demand of food, increase access, and measure impact. And it will require long-term investments in systems change. Young people are ready to take a lead um, and support this work because we know that achieving a more equitable future um, requires that everyone has the food they need to thrive. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Akira, you're here from Japan, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you'd like to see from this year's meeting, and also tell us a little bit about the initiative that you're responsible for that offers so much potential in terms of uh, a way forward for communities? Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm so, this is, this is an honor to be here. Then I'm quite enjoying the moment that no one has idea where I'm coming from. And I need to correct that I represent Zero Waste Academy as an organization here. But where we are is that I'm based in a very small community called Kamikatsu in Japan. And it is just like, like one of the example of small rural communities that we have only 1,500 as a population. And over half of the population is above the age of 65 years old. Yes. Then, of course, young people leave from the rural communities to seek for the better opportunities. But what is unique about our town is that we are the first town or the municipal government declared for that zero waste ambition by 2020. What is zero waste? It is a policy and initiatives to make no waste out of the community. But how do we do that? We enrolled all the residents in the community to bring their waste to only one waste collection center to segregate them into 45 different categories. And then that also um, influenced the businesses locally to enroll into waste reduction initiatives and so on. But what it matters to me, actually I'm not originally from the town. I moved in from the city. Then for me, I believe in the possibilism that I see that by showcasing what a small community can do, and we can all believe in that how much each individual of us can do to change the world. And that's what I want to see happening here in Davos. Because in our community, we have already achieved up to 80% of resource recovery, which is already massive. But at the same time, the rest of the 20% will not happen unless we enroll everyone on board. Because even in such a small town, we have so much interconnection between the rest of the world. We have so many resources coming in from the rest of the world, and we cannot recycle them because it's not designed to be recycled, or we don't have invest, investment just by ourselves to actually have the technology to do so. Then we need to see the system change so that everyone shifts into the circulation, circular economy, so that we can actually make 100% happen in all over the world. So I would say we see that everyone talks about circular economy. Everyone agree that it is important to shift towards the circular economy. But are we fast enough? Are we fast enough that to make sure that we see the same beautiful us, not in the digital, but in our own eyes, and then we have the same experience left for our children? Then I would say, as a last expectation, Every global need leader is here, needs to be localized. The globalization 4.0 should start with localization, because that's where you see what is happening, what you need to take action as a first step. Then that is my expectation. Thank you very much. Akira, thank you very much. 
Um, lastly, I want to turn to somebody I had the privilege of meeting in uh, July last year in Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya, which is Mohammed. Mohammed, can you tell us a little bit about your journey here and about what you would like to see from the participants here in Davos this week? Uh, thank you, Adrian. <clears throat> thank you for giving me the chance to be here. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to begin with. How do I put 20 years of disappointment into words? You know, I've been, for the past couple of days, since I was told I would speak, I've been thinking of what to say and how do I put that into words? How do I bottle the emotions and what I feel into words for you people or for people to understand? My name is Mohammed Hassan and I come and I'm a refugee from Kakuma Camp in Northwestern Kenya. And the theme of my life has been displacement and confine confinement. I've spent the last 20 years of my life in a camp and I will go back to that camp next week. So what is at stake here is very, it's, it's, it's crucial for me and the people that I represent in the camps. The place I come from, the camp, it's not an isolated place. We have 185,000 refugees from 10 different nationalities. And we're, all, we're just like other people and we have aspirations and we have dreams and we have needs. And it surprises me that money and capital moves around the world in seconds, but it takes a refugee decades. Or in the case of my mother, she never had a chance to get out, waiting for 25 years for a place to go, for a place to call home. What does it all mean? We talk about ethical and sustainable development. We talk about how we can be ethical with robots and machines. We want to solve death. And there's so much human suffering. We haven't figured out life yet. And I feel I'm on the sidelines watching in, and not just me as an individual, but the people that I represent. And I'm here at Davos to say that, you know, refugee camps are not ethical, putting people in faraway places and pretending that they don't exist. That is not ethical, it's not sustainable, and it's not conducive for human growth. It kills people, it kills the spirit. And that's what keeps me up at night. Will I spend the next 20 in the camp? Will my brothers and sisters, will they have a chance to, to have a home, to own a document, to have a sense of belonging and identity? And I don't see that people don't talk about those things, you know, in a global stage, and I don't hear those conversations. People would rather pretend that we don't exist. I'm not asking for much, I'm just asking for equal opportunity to be given the tools that I need to thrive and to make a life for myself. I'm asking for access to education, access to documents, access to a future that I can feel I am part of. And I'm asking for all of you to demystify the refugee experience. We are not animals and we are not criminals. It's not a crime to flee from your country. I don't know what you're all afraid of, you know. We're human beings and refugees are real people. Get a chance to know us. We're not that different from you. It can happen to anyone. And that's the message that I want, I want to get across to Davos so that when I go back to my camp, I can tell my refugees I represented them well and I tried my best to, the, to my capabilities to portray and to show you how they feel. Um, globalization 4.0, it's, it's such a big topic, it's a lofty, it's a lofty ideal. But I just want to take all of you to task as you go back. My story is inspiring, I get that. But what do I inspire you to do? It's not just words, it's people's lives that's at stake. I hope you can understand that. Uh, that's the words that I know, and I hope it's simple enough for people to understand. Thank you very much. Mohammed, and to all our co-chairs, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your expectations. Um, I know in Swiss style, we've run out of a little bit of time, but if anyone has a question they'd like to put to our co-chairs now, we can take maybe one or two questions quickly, uh, or there'll be a chance afterwards to have 
uh, an opportunity to meet one to one with them. Just a quick question in the front row. Yeah. Quick question. Catherine Cunningham, uh, writing for Thrive Global <coughs> and interviewing with Eurovision. First of all, um, what's so important at these annual meetings is who is in the room in these discussions. And I have to say, it's a real, really bold and visionary move that uh, the World Economic Forum took to have the global shapers here. These stories, your vision, your mission is really inspiring. Thank you. So my question is, how important is it to a company's long-term existence, your legacy, to reimagine itself? Because that's really the theme, to fix a broken system, but to reimagine itself. What are the cri key criteria to do so and the critical barriers to overcome to do so? That's a great triple question. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if we've got uh, all the time to get everyone's opinion on the, on the, on the panel to answer it. But um, it's an excellent point. What do companies have to do to uh, make that transition? Um, Sasha, if I can perhaps turn yeah. to you first. I mean, I think it's the question of our times because what's really come to the forefront is how multi-constituent really our world is, uh, even for a company. Uh, the idea of being responsible to your shareholders is absolutely still uh, real. Every quarter I need to show up and talk to my shareholders in terms of what have we done for them lately. But the reality now is that unless and until we understand that there are many other constituents around every community and every country that we serve, that we need to create that economic surplus that will allow them to thrive. You know, the, some of my co-chairs you know, co here talk so eloquently about what people look for, which is just access, access to opportunity. That is so necessary. For any business to be long-term successful, without that opportunity being democratized, there is no business going forward. That, I think, is what needs to be understood by every shareholder of every company as well, and every management team, and every CEO like myself. And I think that's the real structural change in this uh, next phase of uh, globalization 4.0, the industrial revolution 4.0. That's, I think, the foundational change that needs to happen. Any of your co-chairs want to come in on what you'd like to see companies do to transform themselves? I personally, um, sorry. Yeah. So I think it's not a one, co can, the challenges cannot be met by one corporation, one, one nation, or even one continent. All stakeholders, all nations have to work collectively to address these challenges. Um, because we want to have all stakeholders and everybody on the same table discussing so we don't ex exclude anybody. The suffering of one nation uh, can have a much wider impact in our connected world of today. So that would be, I think, uh, what I expect from the, the annual meeting and the discussions, that to be steered in a way that the solutions are inclusive. Yes, I think companies should go to the, to the high school system and help young people to be ready for the future. That is one thing. So CEOs should give time and be mentors. And second, in a lot of countries, interns are not being paid by a lot of, and a lot of companies, they, they're not being paid. So if we want to improve young people's lives, we have to pay them for the work that they do. That is one way, and I think CEOs should, we, ha we should have this conversation about internship around the world, because young people, they have been trained, you know, they go to college, they have spent a lot of time studying, but when they go to a company, they say, okay, good luck, you are my intern, but they are not receiving any money. Uh, from from their work. That's a great point. I would like to point out that we pay our interns properly. <laughs> Nora. So I think it's a common thread between any stakeholder that when you look for action, you look outside of yourself. When you look to address inequalities, you say, let's do some CSR in Bangladesh. When you talk about climate action, you you just add on something to the company. If we want to address issues systematically, then we have to put it at the core. If a company is serious about inequalities, pay your workers, give them a decent job, pay your interns. If you care about climate action, 
reshape your business model so that you reduce emissions. Be honest with your shareholders um, that return on investment might not come in this year or next year, but it will come eventually because climate action is profitable. It's just not profitable in the very short term. You mentioned the word legacy, which I think is um, just a word that I would imagine should be at the top of everyone's mind when they think about the work they do today. Um, and I think to drive these long-term changes, it's going to take a lot of courage and leadership um, from the folks who have the privilege of power. Um, and I think uh, always remembering and thinking about creative ways to benefit all your constituents and especially those who are most vulnerable um, will help shape the future and, and cement your legacy. Akira Mohammed. Yep, work with us that who makes you uncomfortable. That's really the point because not excluding the ones makes you feel uncomfortable, but like these are the ones who actually challenge you and make it happen. Mohammed. Uh, in my view, it's imperative that the private sector and the companies that they take initiative in the refugee context, how do we move away from seeing refugees as a burden to society, from dependency on aid in handouts to seeing refugees as a partners in development, you know, investing in refugees for the long term so that they can contribute to society and they can be productive members of the world. Yeah. And I just want to say at this annual meeting, we are um, we're being helped in our video production process by someone who's joined from Kakuma and who's working here. And I think you know it's an absolute straightforward demonstration of the fact that people in those camps have skills, they have talents, those skills and talents can be put to use. And uh, I think uh, it's a, a message that we'd love to see coming out of here along with all the other very important messages that our co-chairs have, which is to say that business working together with those stakeholders can make a real difference to improve the lives of people and to improve some of the issues that you're going to see on stage here today not least of which are going to start this morning with a plenary session with all of these folks for which reason i'm going to have to wrap things up because otherwise i'll get into trouble uh but uh we can hear more from them later on thank you all for joining us and i hope you have a very productive and informative annual meeting and my great thanks to all of our co-chairs here thank you <laughs>